Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. Congratulations on getting a seat to the hottest ticket in town. <laughs> Welcome, I'm Daisha Harwood, the executive director here at the museum. I want to just acknowledge our trustees in attendance. I believe Chris Greco, Sheila um, Snow, and Sharon Bradford are all here. So please welcome them. While I have all of your attention, I want to thank uh, two very important foundations that allow our work here to continue daily. And that is the WWW Foundation and the Hutton Parker Foundation. So last week, we officially opened up two exhibitions, Lockwood DeForest, Lighting the Way, and Huguet Marcel Clark, A Portrait of the Artist. We did it in a little bit of a funny order because of COVID, but we had a huge turnout, and I didn't get a chance to thank my team, so I just want to thank them now. Jim, Emily, Adela, Chris, Michael, and everyone who works here at the Historical Museum. So please, a round of applause for my staff. We obviously could not have hosted um, the Clark exhibition here without the incredible collaboration of the Bella Squardo Foundation. And so I want to go ahead and bring up Jeremy Lindemann, the foundation president, to talk just a little bit about the artwork that we're showing. My name is Jeremy uh, Lindemann with the Bella Squardo Foundation. And uh, on behalf of myself, the foundation, and my board chair, Dick Wolf, we really want to thank Daisha and the museum for hosting us today. Uh, it's a great space and we're, we're very excited. Uh, I'd also need to thank a couple of people myself and first off I want to apologize, I'm going to put you on the spot, but Ian Cummings, are you here? I saw your name on the list. Uh, he is, there he is. So Ian is a family member and I wanted to thank you for, for uh, a family member of the Clarks and I wanted to thank you for coming. So, and I just found out looking at the list earlier. So. Ah, oh, no, we don't do that here, so. I also need to thank uh, Sandy Nicholson uh, of the Bell Squadron Foundation, Jack Overall, and Josh Conviser. I'm not, he might have had to have ducked out real quick. So uh, the paintings that you see in the uh, exhibit today uh, were all, we believe, done in Santa Barbara, but they were stored in New York, and uh, they were stored there for quite a while as we slowly, gradually moved through uh, all of the material left to the estate. And uh, so a lot of the work needed some cleaning up and some, some rehabbing. And I want to thank Patty West and her team. I'm not sure if she's here, but they did just an amazing job cleaning the pieces and, and making them all look great. And I also want to thank Sharon Bradford, who generously stepped up and helped underwrite that effort. And um, uh, I think with that, uh, we'll turn it back over to Daisha and, and uh, Bill, so thank you. Does everybody know Bill Dedman? He's been here just a few times over the past eight years. So if you haven't met Bill, um, Bill got his start in journalism at the age of 16 um, as a copy boy at the Chattanooga Times. He has since written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and many other pu uh, publications. In 1989, he received the Pulitzer Prize, Prize in Investigative Reporting for The Color of Money, his series of articles on racial discrimination by mortgage lenders in middle-income black neighborhoods. His work led to expanded federal laws on disclosure and greater awareness of this systemic discrimination. 30 years later, he won several awards for his undercover investigation of racial steering by real estate agents entitled Long Island Divided. During his eight years at NBC News, Bill uncovered stories from the Pentagon's slow efforts to identify servicemen and women killed in past wars to fatal problems with firefighter safety equipment. Bill stumbled upon the mystery of Yvette Clark and her father, the Gilded Age industrialist who founded Las Vegas, and the rest, as they say, is history. He co-wrote Clark, with Clark, Clark's cousin, par, Paul Clark Newell, the biography Empty Mansions. The book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list and was chosen among the best books in 2013. 
Since the release of the book, he's told me he's given at least 200 presentations. I think it's actually higher. Um, his first adventure here still holds the record uh, for the greatest attendance um, by a talk here at the Historical Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, please, um, I want to introduce you to one of the most generous people that I know, Bill Denman. Good evening. Did you enjoy Uget's paintings? It is a pleasure to see so many familiar faces here uh, from previous visits to Santa Barbara and to the Historical Museum. I'd like to thank uh, the museum trustees, my friend Dacia, and uh, it's been great to see the materials that the museum staff has dug out of Uget's papers with the cooperation of the Bellascuardo Foundation. Um, one letter caught my eye. It was uh, one of many letters that museum, uh, that uh, movie producers and uh, authors wrote to Uget through the years, trying to persuade her to participate in a book about her famous father and herself. And this letter was almost threatening. We know a lot of things about your family, but I want to put just the positive part in, the, the letter said. <laughs> and all of these implorations were turned down flat through the years. This, this author warned Uget, if you don't cooperate with me, then surely your story will be written by some other hack that will come along later. He was right. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Maybe we'll work all their new research into the script for the TV series based on empty mansions if it comes to fruition. We have a new option on the book with a new company for a series. I think it's always a long shot. Unless we can figure out a way to get Batman living over at Bellasquardo, I think that would help. But a writer is working on a script for, for a pilot. Um, and the continuing interest in the Gilded Age, uh, especially the, the recent HBO, the current HBO series by that name, I, I think probably hasn't hurt. So we'll see. I'd like to also thank the trustees and staff uh, at the Bellasquardo Foundation for lending these paintings and artifacts so we can all see them. And uh, th thank you, Mr. Cummings, and any other members of the Clark family who are here tonight. Your grandfather or great-grandfather was Charlie, the senator's elder son? Great-grandfather. Great thank you. I hope that you get would enjoy some of this attention. I won't pretend to know what she would be thinking. Um, my fellow author, Paul Clark Newell, her uh, first cousin, and I were careful not to put any thoughts into her head, not to, uh, to, to create internal monologues. We wrote a nonfiction book. We didn't know what she was thinking. But working from what we do know, on the one hand, she was a serious artist, professionally trained. Now she's getting her first exhibition in 91 years. <laughs> we do see that she, can keep, that she kept all the newspaper clippings and copies of the invitations and other materials from her exhibition at Washington's Corcoran Gallery of Art and in Paris in 1929 and 1931. And we know that she was not shy about sharing her paintings with her friends and family, making small, some of these paintings were seven feet tall. She would make small prints of them, um, carefully made, inserting them in her Christmas or New Year's cards to share each year. On the other hand, you may have heard that Uget was famously reclusive. Um, some of the works we see here were unfinished, um, unsigned, or unframed, and I don't know what she would have thought about whether they were ready for you to see them. And would she want us 
having these sorts of conversations where we evaluate her life. I have noticed a quirk about Santa Barbara. Tell me if you've experienced this. Um, people here seem um, quick to tell you about the internal life of someone they've never met. <laughs> there, there are certainly fewer than five people here um, who ever uh, spoke with or corresponded with you get. Yet people are always saying to me, oh, uh, she was suffering from this, or uh, she was on that spectrum, or uh, she was traumatized by that, or her life was so sad. Well, she didn't sound sad in the least. I, I hear often from people in Santa Barbara, uh, oh, this is what you get wants, or oh, that would not be what you get wants. People who never met her. I, I, it makes me wonder if uh, spiritualism is coming back, if uh, <laughs> seances and ghostly conversations are popular in Santa Barbara. But I do know that one of you gets frequent expressions, and I know this because I can hear it in some of the tape recordings that her cousin Paul made of their conversations, um, is the word imagine. Let me uh, back out of this picture for a moment. And uh, with uh, Jim's help over there, I'm just going to play you what is just simply a voicemail message that you get left for Paul before they'd ever met. Think about it. He's trying to contact his famously reclusive relative. He's told, well, she's not going to give you her number. So she's trying to call him, but she's not catching him at home. And this is her first message, but listen for that key word in this. All right, after you. Oh, this is your aunt again. And I did call the other number, but I didn't get an answer. So I'm leaving, but I'll call you up soon again because just now I have chicken pox of all the things to get a hold of at my age, imagine. So anyway, but I'm getting along fine. The fever went down and everything's okay. And much love and thank you for the pictures. Your daughter's beautiful and your little grandson is adorable. Your little grandson, Eric. She doesn't sound reclusive there. She sounds prepared for the conversation. She's got the names of his grandchildren at uh, her fingertips. She's revealing uh, an illness that she's having with a cousin who's been vouched for, but she's never met him and would never meet him, though they would talk on the phone for 10 years. Um, but I can imagine you get uh, reacting to the idea of having an art exhibit after 91 years, saying, 91 years, imagine. <laughs> now, if all you know about you get is that she was reclusive, that she didn't visit her fabulous home here for 60 years, that she may not have gone out of the house much for 50 years, that she lived her last 20 years in a simple hospital room, then these paintings may be a revelation to you about her and her enthusiasms. Uh, yes, you get choices in life were peculiar, another favorite word of hers, peculiar. If you're taking photographs on a summer afternoon of children playing with sailboats on the pond in Central Park where uh, Stuart Little raced sailboats, if you remember that true story. Um, <laughs> and if you then collect those photos in storybooks, creating little narratives. If you're taking photos of a marionette show in Central Park but you're not taking any of those photos from Central Park, but you're taking them all with a very long lens from your 12th floor apartment. That's peculiar. I thought that we settled the main point in empty mansions that being an introvert is not a diagnosis. That even being a little uneasy or anxious with new people is not an illness. Being protective of your privacy is a reasonable life choice. You know, I went to school with some people who were 
uh, wealthy Coca-Cola bottlers and that sort. Um, and I've noticed that they're the ones who don't share pictures of all their family and friends on Facebook. Uh, either that or they've blocked me. That's possible. <laughs> But as Paul and I wrote uh, in the last chapter of Empty Mansions, it is impossible to listen to Huguette's conversations, to read her correspondence, to read how she wrote to friends and how they wrote to her, to see her paintings, and to see her as anything other than creative and lively, educated, interested in others, generous and kind. Uh, kindness is underrated. I, I, I've yet to run across any example of you get saying or writing an unkind word to anyone. And these are no small feats considering that she had the misfortune of being born into one of the world's great fortunes. Just a little bit of timeline to catch you up if you're new to this story. Huguette was born in Paris in 1906. Lived there with her mother and her older sister, Andre, while her father, W.A. Clark, was serving in the United States Senate, representing Montana. When Huguette was one year old, the New York Times tried to figure out who the richest Americans were. And they, their final judgment was that it's a tie that if you count what's been already brought out of the ground, the wealthiest American was John D. Rockefeller with his oil money from Pennsylvania. But if you included the wealth still in the mines of Arizona and Montana, W.A. Clark, another Pennsylvanian who went west, was equally wealthy. When you get was four, they moved into the largest home in New York City with 121 rooms for a family of four. <laughs> Just here's a little glimpse of the Clark Mansion on Fifth Avenue with its soaring tower, a great place for hide and seek, with a railroad spur coming in underneath to bring coal for the furnaces, with a golden room brought from Paris, the $120,000 pipe organ, there we go, and an organist, of course, on staff to play it. A parlor large enough for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir to sing. And the doors flung open on Saturdays from 3 to 6 for the public to come in and tour the five art galleries. That's Huguette and her mother and her sister in Central Park with the Clark Tower behind them. And in the snow with the Clark Mansion behind them. When Huguette was five, her father showed the girls the photos of the staterooms that they were going to stay in on a new ship as it made its second voyage across the Atlantic. That ship, of course, was the Titanic. Never made its second voyage. Her father rushed down to the docks in New York to try to get news of Huguette's cousin Walter who went down with the Titanic. His uh, wife and uh, son were saved. They found Walter's watch on the bottom of the Atlantic just a few years ago. It seemed to me you told me some time ago about your return trip, uh, how you'd been booked to go on the Titanic back well, to Europe. We didn't get on the Titanic. We, we were booked to go. Yes. But then actually never got to New York because it sank before we got in. Yes. Which boat did you take then? So, so we took another boat out there. Uh-huh, yes. And it was George Washington. Huguette's father was on the covers of magazines as the face of corruption in politics. When she was six, to keep her father and his ilk out of the United States Senate, the states changed the U.S. Constitution, giving the power to the people to elect senators. When Huguette was 12, her older sister Andre died of meningitis. Andre's last diary entry begins, in two weeks I shall be 17. At prep school in New York with the 
Carnegie daughter as a classmate? You get it was the one with the wealthier father, making you get the number one kidnapping target in the world's financial capital. Huguette was just 17 when her father died. I want to go ahead to a picture. That's it. W.A. Clark was 86. In his wallet uh, was this card. Two months before he had died, he had renewed his license to carry a pistol in New York City. There he is with his wild eyes and hair. He listed his height generously as five foot seven. And his occupation, can you see it on the third written line there? Capitalist. <laughs> After her father died of pneumonia, not in a pistol duel, and his last will was published, 17-year-old Duguette was the subject of a series of cartoons in New York newspapers as the poor little rich girl with the cartoonist imagining Duguette's life, having breakfast in bed, spending her $333 a day allowance shopping, going out to the opera, going to parties. When she was 22, her wedding here in Santa Barbara was in the best newspapers. At 24, her divorce was in all the papers. Having missed the Titanic, New York, uh, Uget was still in New York City on 9-11 and a decade beyond. She died in 2011 at age 104, two weeks short of her 105th birthday. And she had lived in a simple hospital room the last 7,364 nights of her life. But the last photograph of her that was published while she lived, we have some others here, but the last that was published while she lived was this photo where the photographer caught her awkwardly on the dock in San Francisco headed either to or from her honeymoon in Hawaii. Now, I'm not here to focus on some of the topics that are covered in empty mansions that we've talked about before. How I stumbled into the story as my wife and I were shopping for a home in Connecticut and discovered hers, the most expensive for sale in the state at $28 million and unoccupied for 60 years or about how her grand home in Santa Barbara had stayed occupied, unoccupied, or her three apartments in New York City, or the red flags in her finances. Think about, there was an elderly woman living alone in a hospital room, a Renoir painting had been sold for $23 million, the house was for sale in Connecticut, a $10 million Degas painting had been stolen from her apartments, while she lived, lived in the hospital. Citibank had lost or sold off all of her mother's jewelry. Her accountant was a registered sex offender. Her lawyer's favorite charity had received a $2 million gift. Her nurse had received $30 million in gifts. The hospital was grasping for donations. Doctors had borrowed millions from her she had signed two wills within six weeks, giving absolutely contradictory instructions. I'm not here to talk about any of that. <laughs> I do want to focus a little bit on Uget's life with her mother, Anna, here in Santa Barbara, show you some photos you haven't seen before, and maybe give a few updates or at least some perspectives on her life. First, we need to talk just a little bit about her father and where the money came from. So I'm going to move ahead. We'll get back to these. Don't you worry. One of these three miners in Colorado would become the richest man west of the Mississippi. He's the one on our right, W.A. Clark, born in a log cabin in Pennsylvania in 1839. 
and his daughter lived into the Obama administration. He took a little college, a little law. He went to Colorado for gold, or at least to get away from the draft that was coming for the Civil War. He went up to Montana, where he made money in merchandising, then a little in mining, then in banking, carrying the mail through Indian country. Started a bank with his brother, but it wasn't called Clark Brothers. It was called W.A. Clark and brother. <laughs> he moved into mining and then into politics. He raised one family, then after his wife died, he married a second time and began a new family with two daughters. It is difficult to sum up the sprawling career of W.A. Clark, but I'm going to do it in this long paragraph, if you don't mind. An indefatigable worker, W.A. carried on at a pace that today seems impossible, especially in an era when travel was by steamship and railroad and communication by letter and telegram. During the first decade of the 1900s, for example, he maintained homes in Paris and Montana, built and furnished the most expensive house in New York City, constructed out of his own pocket a major railroad connecting Los Angeles Harbor with Salt Lake City and on to the east, subdivided along the railroad and marketed lots for a new city that was called Clark's Las Vegas Town Site. That's why Las Vegas is in Clark County. Oversaw the operation of copper mines in several western states, ran streetcar and electric power companies in the west and a bronze foundry and copper wire factory in the east, grew sugar beets, 10,000 acres of them, near Long Beach, published several newspapers, owned a bank with a good national reputation, was forced to resign from the U.S. Senate, then was reelected and served six more years. Fought off a paternity suit filed by a young woman he had met at the Democratic National Convention. <laughs> Some things never change. Traveled through Europe collecting art, as a widower, maintained good relations with his adult children, married a wife 39 years younger, and sired two daughters, all of that while in his 60s. W.A. Clark was certainly a genius at business, but where he ruined his reputation was in politics. He wanted to be known as Senator Clark. But even before he could take his seat in the Senate, he was accused of having gotten that seat through bribery. The, the schemes were found out. The way it would work is this way. The testimony was that I need your vote, so I will give you, I, the Clark's men would give you an envelope and have you write your name on the back of the envelope. The envelope contained $1,000 bills. They would seal the envelope with your initials on the back of it and put it back in their pocket until after the vote for senator. Even after he was forced to resign, Clark was impervious to shame. He ran again, and the legislature in Montana sent him back to Washington. He served a full term and then retired, known the rest of his life as Senator Clark. But the citizens had seen enough of stored about elections, and the 17th Amendment took away from the legislatures and gave to the people the right to elect senators. Individual voters were thought to be less corruptible. This was way before Facebook. Right? When Clark was remembered at all, it was in the words of Mark Twain. And Mark Twain was severely compromised on this score. Twain had been rescued, Samuel Clemens had been rescued from bankruptcy by the Standard Oil men who were in political and business opposition to Clark in Montana. And to amuse his benefactors, Twain said this about W.A. Clark. He is as rotten a human being as can be found anywhere under the flag. He is a shame to the American nation, and no one has helped to send him to the Senate who did not know that his proper place was the penitentiary with a ball and chain on his legs. Well, you can make a point that this was just 
Twain carrying on for the benefit of it, uh, Clark's opponents. But when Mark Twain gets you, you're God. I think one way to think of Clark's story is as one of vanity getting the best of a very talented man. You know, he was a little dynamo of a man. Um, his sons testified in a court case that he was five foot five in his prime, maybe five foot six with his boots on. After he was chosen to lead, uh, to preside over the Constitutional Convention in Montana, bringing Montana into statehood, he wrote on his passport, ap passport application that he was five foot nine. After he led the battle to place um, the state capital in Helena, which at the time was said to have more millionaires per capita than any city in America. After he was chosen the head of the state Masonic Lodge and after he entered politics, he became 5'10". <laughs> now, though W.A. Clark was mostly a 19th century man. His time was not altogether different from today, if you think about it. Consider, he lived in a time of increasing concentration of wealth in the top 1% of the 1%, which Twain called the Gilded Age. It was a time of money flowing unregulated into politics. Does this seem familiar? Still, it is impossible, I think, to think of any modern day figure who's equivalent to W.A. Clark. Think about it. He lived in the biggest tower on Fifth Avenue. He was a wealthy man who wanted to be in politics and wanted to start at the top. He put his business in the care, uh, let's pretend, of his two sons to run while he ran for office. What? He was, he was accused of stealing an election, endured a public trial in the U.S. Senate, and then was accused of trying to steal another election. No one today reminds us of W.A. Clark. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I see where you're going with this. I see where, no, no, so you've got the wrong end of the stick. W.A. Clark did not inherit his money. You're, think, you're not thinking of an equivalent case. <laughs> now, let's talk about Santa Barbara, shall we? Just over at the end of East Beach, on a hill called Booth's Point, looking out at the Pacific, sat a home called Bellasquardo a 22,000 square foot Italianate home on 24 acres. It's not the home that's there now. You may not know that the current home was not the first home called Bellasguardo in that place, where a Chumash encampment had been many years earlier. In 1903, an Oklahoma oil man, an oil man named William Miller Graham and his wife, Lee Eleanor Graham, built a home. This is their daughter, who was a little bit of a wild child, and she had a thatched roof cottage on the property that she lived in instead of living in the great house. The sign that you can't quite read on the right says, Geraldine Graham's Cottage. After the Clarks bought the home, they renamed it Andre's Cottage in honor of their daughter who had died four years earlier. The Grahams attached the name Bellasguardo. It's an Italian home. It got an Italian name, Beautiful Lookout. One party thrown by the theatrical Mrs. Graham included a psychic, a juggler, and a trained monkey. The estate was used several times as a film set by your Flying A film studio during the silent film era, serving in one film as a Roman emperor's palace for a one reeler called the Days of Trajan. Now, the Grahams went through a divorce and needed cash, and so Mrs. Graham began to rent out the home, and the Clarks arrived. That's a family of three at this point. 
84-year-old W.A. Clark, his 45-year-old wife, Anna, and their 17-year-old daughter, you get. Remember, by this point, the family was as much of a West Coast family as an East Coast family. Think about it. Clark had settled his mother and several of his siblings in Los Angeles. He was farming those sugar beets in Long Beach. He had built the railroad from Los Angeles to Salt Lake City. He still had business in Las Vegas. His son, W.A. Jr., was prominent in Los Angeles, founding the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And their largest business interest was no longer in Montana, but in Arizona at the United Verde Mine in Jerome and the company town of Clarkdale, where the invitations to the high school graduation were printed on sheets of copper. <laughs> After renting for a summer, the Clarks bought the Graham home in 1923 for $300,000, take it or leave it. And Mrs. Graham took it. The Clarks inherited the Graham's gardens. They renamed that rustic cottage for their daughter. W.A. Clark had only a short time to enjoy this vacation home. When Huguette was 18, her father died at age 86. I just want to show you a few pictures of Anna, his surviving second wife, before we let those get away with us. The great home on Fifth Avenue was torn down, having been lived in for only 15 years. Instead of the sort of trusts that kept the Rockefeller interest going, the bulk of the Clark estate was divided among five children, five equal shares for four surviving children from his first marriage, he was widowed, and the one surviving child to get in the second marriage. His wife, Anna, received a few million dollars and some unknown amount in a prenuptial agreement. But most importantly, the children let her have Bella Squardo. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the life of the mother and the daughter after the father died. They moved into apartments down Fifth Avenue when the great horse house was torn down. You get finished high school. She was in her senior year when her father died. She was at Miss Spence's school in New York City taking dance lessons from Isadora Duncan. They traveled frequently to Santa Barbara, having bought the home here, especially to avoid the hot summers in New York City. They enjoyed the beach cabanas. They held summer concerts. They had a tree house built in an oak tree overlooking the lawn. Anna sponsored a group called the Paganini Quartet because she had procured four Stradivarius instruments that were supposedly owned by Paganini. She gave them to these musicians she favored and they played classical music around the world and played in the tree house at Bella Squardo. Of course, you need a place to relax while you're not on tour, so she brought them a, bought them a house in Carmel by the ocean. <laughs> Newspapers show Anna and you get entertaining, friends visiting. There's a box of uh, Fiesta costumes over at Bella Squardo. The grounds were open for garden clubs to visit. You get roamed the gardens taking photographs. Huguette was a founding member of the Valley Club and kept up her membership until she died. Uh, I'm told there are two sets of golf clubs still over there used in, in the basement. She joined the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. She was very active in working with a local company, a company that had a local branch, the Marsh Company, J.T. Marsh and Company, importers of Asian art on her art projects helping her communicate with artists in Japan about her tabletop model castles, about her paintings, getting authenticity in her paintings about kimonos and lifestyle and names for the women in her paintings, etc. She commissioned imperial wedding robes with 12 layers of silk. One of them was displayed here at this museum. 
I'd like to read you something that Katerina Marsh of the Marsh family said about working with Uget. Let's find that. There it is. Katerina says, she'd say, isn't that peculiar? She said, I still have that voice in my ear. She was always polite, always asked about my husband and my son. She was just a delightful person. I think she had fun, don't you think? And you get was generous here. She wrote a check for $50,000 to establish the bird refuge named for her sister, Andre Clark, turning a fetid swamp or lagoon into ponds for the birds, and later kept issuing checks as it needed repeated replenishment and renovation. Now, as you can see in the pictures in the exhibit, I'll go back here, you get, while they rebuilt the Bell Esquardo home, which I'll get to in a moment, needed a place to paint. So she had a studio next door here at the Meridian Studios, as described in the exhibit. And the staff here found photos of her particular studio with her paintings. Some of the paintings in this exhibit are on the wall there. Here's a woman apparently dressed uh, uh, as a, a model for you get one of you gets paintings. And as the staff has discovered, you get also participated in one public art show here at the Faulkner Gallery at your free public library. Maybe more than one. Now, I want to put up the show of you gets paintings. The first couple of these are paintings of you get by her painting instructor. This is by Tade Stika. Some members of the family say Stika. He said Stika, a Polish painter from a painting family who had become the celebrity fashion painter in New York. He's got Uget there keeping her eyes fixed firmly on her canvas. <laughs> There's Stika. We know Stika mostly today through this painting that's on TV a lot. It's the Roosevelt in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. The rest of the paintings in this show are by Uget. We think she painted at least up through World War II into her 40s, maybe well beyond. Eventually her eyesight ran out. She stayed close to her instructor and became the godmother of his child. Very nice Art Deco earrings. A Fiesta portrait. Several drawings that we have. A painting that's in this exhibit. Several nudes of women and men. Many still lifes, particularly of Japanese subjects. A bit more about their connections to Santa Barbara. Anna and Nuget were here at Bell Esquardo on the morning of June 29, 1925. All of her later conversations with her cousin Paul would begin with her asking, as same way your conversations with your East Coast relatives began, are those wildfires near you? I heard about the earthquake, was that must be in your yard, right? And so the day of this conversation that we'll play for you, there'd been a, a terrible earthquake in Turkey. And we're gonna play, I'll put the words on the screen. And uh, Jim's gonna play us some sound here. 
All these national uh, catastrophes, international catastrophes. I was concerned about what you were in the 1925 place, 1925. The movie theater that we used to go to, that came all down, imagine. Oh, Many yeah. people would have been killed if it had been, you know, it was six in the morning. Yes. So many people were saved. And my mother built another house because it wasn't very solid, you know. <sighs> Anyway, there was something, you know, that shaking. Oh, it's terrifying. Yes, terrible, yes. Yes. But, but it, it was nothing in comparison to Turkey. Huguette was married at Balasquardo in 1928 at the old Graham house, the old house she was married. You saw some pictures earlier from her wedding. She was 22. Her husband, a uh, recent Princeton alum, was a year older. He just started out in business. She'd known him all her, her life. He was the son of her father's accountant. This was not the lavish weddings that the Clarks were used to. The wedding will be extremely quiet, the newspaper said. A small group, a Catholic priest, a formal lace gown in the short style of the time with a cathedral train. The Gowers, Bill Gower and you get, honeymooned in Hawaii, first driving about the West and then to San Francisco in her new 1927 gray-green Rolls Royce, a wedding present from Anna, with silver door handles. Uh, cost about $25,000 at the time. That would be about $300,000 today. And somehow it didn't go well. Um, as Uget's nurse relayed later, Uget said, on the honeymoon I had to go home. And the Gowers moved in together in New York, but it was over within months. Officially within two years, there was a divorce in Reno. And then you get sailed to Hawaii again with her mother this time for a post-divorce trip. You know, life is full of surprises. Um, we were astonished in, in working on the book to find that Nuget had corresponded with a Bill Gower for decades after the divorce. Indeed, they had sent sweet letters back and forth. I'm sorry your dog died. Come visit me when you're in New York. Don't fail to stop in. It was very surprising. After our book was published, I heard from a man who lived with Bill Gower on the Riviera up until Bill's death. You get would call, he said, and would send gifts, projectors, romantic TV shows, uh, the moon landings, the Olympics things she wanted to make sure they watched. And it turned out, if you're looking for a little tidbit after the book was published, it turned out that Uget's husband preferred men. And he was married to Uget. Then he was married to another woman, and they had a child. And then later, he lived with men the rest of his life. I, I don't pretend to have any secret information about Uget's marriage. And I don't think this changes the narrative at all. It, it seems quite unlikely that he would have ended the marriage. Um, lots of gay men were married to women. And there's no reason to think that he would have ended a marriage with the wealthiest <laughs> woman in New York City. Um, and the key piece of information is that Uget never married again. If she'd wanted to be married, she could have married. She had a, quote, fiancé in France. She had many opportunities. Eventually, he married someone else, and Uget started sending presents to his daughter and her children. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to mention uh, Paul, her cousin and my co-author, and we have conversations with Paul uh, and you get, and they're all in the audio version of our book. There's about half an hour of them chatting about the Titanic and other memories. And Paul and I spoke here when the book came out, and he died in 16 after our book came out. And I just want to mention that the, the main thing that, that uh, I would commend to you is that when you're writing your family story, do what Paul did and finish it. <laughs> Paul's father had been writing a book about the great man in the family, the senator, and died without finishing it. If you ask me, how long did the book say, take? Well, it's two years. Well, uh, Paul would say 22 years, or two generations. And Paul was on the same way to the same fate, perhaps, but we got together and we wrote about the senator and about his daughter. And he had the pleasure of being on the Today Show and talking to public groups like this about his book, but only because he did what so many never do. 
which is to finish their family story. Now, Bell Squarta was damaged in the 25 earthquake. Not destroyed, but damaged. They continued to use it. Huguette was married there. But Anna wanted to build a new house. And she said that she took great pride in building a new house because it gave work to so many people during the Depression. And earthquake proofing was a, was a, a, a benefit as well. Um, the, the new home was built of reinforced concrete with walls 16 inches thick, sheathed in limestone. Anna employed the architect Reginald Johnson, who, as you know, designed the post office here and several fine estates in this area. Um, I heard a few years ago from an, an architect's daughter, a junior architect on the Bellasquardo project, his daughter contacts me and she says, would you like to see drawings of Bellasquardo and photographs of it being built? So would you like to see those? <laughs> These were architects with the name of Reginald Johnson, the drawings with R Johnson's name on them, given to Anna Clark for her new home, showing a fashionable woman standing on the patio. His work is somewhat subdued, elegant. This new home, as the newspapers pointed out, had 27 rooms and 22,000 square feet, about twice the size of Jefferson's Monticello. While the home was being built, and you got, had a studio here at the Meridian, where were they living? They lived down the coast at the Biltmore, same architect. There are lovely stones in the parking court in front of the house. And I noticed that you have a DeRoss family, am I saying that correctly, who sponsored the Lockwood DeForest exhibit in here? Anyone here from that family tonight? And um, a family of stonemasons. And moving ahead, I have to wonder whether that man is in their family. There he is laying those stones the, uh, the architect and the Clarks are standing in the back in the doorway, and there's the man laying those stones in the front of the house in about 1933. Now, in the 50s, it seemed that you get uh, stopped coming out here because her mother got ill, became too ill to travel to make the trip. And you get started shopping for houses in the New York area, she bought a house in Connecticut, which she put a two-story addition on, but never moved a stick of furniture in. And uh, with 53 acres and a river, um, that's the house I had stumbled upon. And uh, Anna had a, a, a difficult last 10 years, some time in a nursing home. And after Anna died in 1963, you got kept Bellasquardo with two instructions. Keep everything in as pristine condition as you can, original condition, and first class condition. Now, those standards weren't always met, but the house looks quite good today with some deferred maintenance. Wor working toilets are always a good thing to have. Her cousin Paul asked you, get, why don't you visit Bellasquardo? And she said, oh, it would make me sad to go there without my mother. It's my mother's home. And um, I always think of times there with my mother, and it makes me sad. So she didn't need to sell it. It was only costing her forty to $80,000 a month. <laughs> but she was too sentimental to visit. Now, a few Clark relatives were allowed to visit. Paul was among them. Um, and you get stayed in regular touch with what was happening at Bellasquardo, getting regular reports. Um, I want to describe to you, we're going to take a tour of Bellasquardo in a moment, but I want to describe to you where the Clark money ended up. W.A. Clark tried to leave his art collection 
to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, but they wouldn't take it because he insisted it stay together forever in one building, so it ended up at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, and his children built a wing to hold it. Now the Corcoran is belly up, and it's been mostly distributed to the National Galleries of Art. The family gave land for the nation's first Girl Scout camp, Camp Andre, in New York, named for their daughter. W.A. Clark built a home named for his mother for working women in Los Angeles so they would have a safe place to live and work. An orphanage in Butte. Lots of stained glass windows and churches. Clark was a uh, Presbyterian, but after he became wealthy, he upgraded and became an Episcopalian. They, they, they built a wonderful garden and amusement park in Butte that people still remember as the nicest thing ever in Butte, Montana. People often ask, how come I've never heard of W.A. Clark? Part of the answer is that he never got to Carnegie's third stage of life. Make the money, enjoy the money, and then give the money away to things that you put your name on. Uh, I mean, for Clark, there were no equivalents of Carnegie Libraries or Rockefeller Center or Vanderbilt University. But it's also worth remembering, I think, that most wealthy people are forgotten. How many of you people here know Cyrus Curtis? Cyrus Curtis, ring a bell? He was one of the 20 wealthiest Americans ever. Magazines, Saturday Evening Post, Ladies Home Journal, James J. Hill, Railroads, William Whiteman, Quinine. These don't ring a bell. Well, how about someone wealthier? Stephen Girard, he's in the top five all time in American wealth. Stephen Girard, saved the U.S. from bankruptcy, doesn't ring a bell. Shipping, banking. I'll let you in on a little secret. The odds are that 100 or 200 years from now, few people will recognize the names of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. They will not be remembered, the odds are, no matter how many planets they embarrass themselves on. <laughs> In Montana, Clark is remembered mostly for the environmental damage that was left behind, more by the other owners, but partly by his companies. The pit that filled up with water, the world's largest Superfund site, that's how most people in Montana think of the, the, the miners. His children made more of a modern mark, and I just want to mention some of their charities. W.A. Jr. founded the Philharmonic funded it for 20 years and played second violin. He paid for most of the Hollywood Bowl, left a great library of rare books to UCLA. The elder son, Charlie's home is now owned by the county in Butte, your great grandfather. Um, and uh, they have arts exhibitions there. Of course, the bird refuge here. You get, gave the family ranch, Rancho Alegre, to the Boy Scouts. And her largest bequest will end up being a new foundation for the arts, the Bellas Guardo Foundation. Um, I want to take you a little bit on a tour of Bellas Guardo with some more recent photos. Is that video moving on your screen? Okay, well, from East Beach, you can't see a thing. Here's what it looks like if you go straight up in the air. You get left her home here, Bella Squardo, to a private foundation created under the supervision of the New York Attorney General's office. Despite a long line of community leaders making pleas through the decades, you get, didn't give her home to the city of Santa Barbara. She didn't give it to the city for public use. She didn't give it to the city at all. 
she gave it to a private foundation. There has been some confusion on this point in the local press. You get herself not a fan of estate planning, gave no instructions about what exactly the foundation should do with its property. All we know is that she loved Ballasquardo, loved it as her mother's home, wanted it to be preserved. And in the terms of the will, left it primarily to promote the arts. A rather vague mandate. Happily, considering the pent up demand in Santa Barbara to visit the Clark Estate, the private foundation has set one of its goals to be opening the home for public tours. The foundation describes its goal this way on its website, honoring the Clark's past and building a future where the estate can be enjoyed by all as a focal point for the arts. Coming up to enjoy a family picnic by the Rose Garden, delving into the estate's history, viewing art from institutions around the world, or taking in a recital on the lawn. So all of that will take commitment and time. The foundation received ownership of the home only in 2018. So that was seven years after you get died before they got the home. Before the pandemic, they held their first fundraiser, a big party for 500 donors on the lawn. Some of you were there. I'm hoping that the foundation's application to the city for a permit to change its use. You can have weddings up there, you can have uh, uh, fundraisers up there, but to have daily tours up there, you need a change in your use with the city, a conditional use permit. So they've applied for that, and I'm hoping that that is a success. I'm hoping it gets permission for its tours. Then someday soon, we can all buy our time ticket as we do at other historic places, and, um, sit in the music room and listen to home recordings of you get on the violin and Anna on the harp. And sit out on the patio, looking at the ocean, maybe having afternoon tea for half an hour and just pretending that we own the place. That's my hope. Uh, let me close with a couple of regrets. Um, one regret I have is that some people, at least before they read our book, or maybe they didn't get to the end of a long book, people say, oh, what a sad life. Despite all the difficulties and constraints of her upbringing, the stresses of publicity, you get found devotion in her life and enjoyment, clearly. Devotion to the arts and to her friends. She played the violin, her mother played the harp. They enjoyed the classical music that they brought to their home. Huguette was relentless and sophisticated in pursuing the arts, trained as a painter, self-taught as a photographer, a shrewd student and collector of her impressionists and neo-impressionists, Renoir, Sargent, Cezanne, Pissarro, Monet, Manet. She explored Japanese culture and history, seeking authenticity for her art projects. She read the classics. She learned to play chess in her 80s on one of her carved Japanese sets. She conversed and wrote in French. She lived a life of imagination. Was it a sad life? From Paul's conversations with her and the correspondence that we have, it's clear that you get focused on happy memories of good times with her family, of playing hide and seek, and listening to her sister's bedroom bedtime stories in the Clark Mansion on Fifth Avenue, of cleverly offering their allowance, their gold coins their banker father had given them as the, the, the key to escape from Paris 
when the Germans were arriving at the start of World War I, of riding surfboards with Duke Kahanamoku at Waikiki Beach. Jim, can I play audio? For my granddaughter? Yes. Is she still dance the ballet? Oh, she's working away at it. They've had a lovely time. They went to Hawaii for a vacation uh, several weeks ago and got out of the cold weather. Honolulu. Uh, yes, they did go to Waikiki, that's right. Have you been there? Oh, yes. I was there when I was 15 and then when I was 22 and 23. Uh huh. I went there several times. You traveled with your with your family there? My, my father, my father in 1950. Uh-huh. We went to, to Honolulu at Waikiki Beach. Uh-huh. It was lovely there. Was the... I think it was more pleasant than those days because it wasn't so built up. It's very commercial now. It's very commercial, yes. Yeah. Yes. Was the Royal Hawaiian Hotel built yes. at that time? That, that's where we were. Oh, how nice. Hawaiian Hotel. In 1915. Is it still there? Is it still it's still there, there yes. Oh, I see. Yes, it is. And uh, the other one, I think, is called the Iwani or something like that, is also still there. First of all, we went in 1915, we went to the, the Moana Hotel. Moana, that's what I was thinking is of. It's still there, too? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, in fact, Leslie said she was there uh, oh. just, uh, just recently. Did you ever see the, the rainbow showers, uh, blossoms? They're beautiful. They're called rainbow showers. We used to surfboard right, with, uh, with uh, um, Kahanamokus, you know, the ones they used to take us out on the surfboard. Kahanamoku, he was the champion swimmer at the time. Uh-huh. And it was kind of safe being with him, you know, in the water. Yes. It was nice, yes. You have a wonderful memory for these details. Because you see, they used to have sharks around there, and if you'd go with them, you'd be more safer. I see. Another regret, a final regret I have, is that some people came away with the idea that you get was selfish. Do you, do you have any hint of that in your estimation of you got selfishness? Um, I guess the view was that, well, she had these homes and she wasn't using them, so that seemed wasteful. She spent her money on upkeep of the homes and on a, the world's finest doll collection. She turned down some appeals for public charities, perhaps because it would expose her to publicity. So I guess even some people in a limited view may not think of giving money to the arts as charity, not a direct social service. I think it just depends on what you emphasize. You get clearly preferred to give money to people she knew. She kept alive through her patronage a generation of the world's greatest illustrators in France, the ones she remembered. She was their pension. If you have an account at the corner store in Deauville in Normandy so your oldest friends can go down and buy chocolates and milk, you are generous. She paid for a decade of nursing home care for one friend. Many friends and employees, even strangers, received her little gift tucked into their Christmas card. It was one of her paintings and a check for $30,000. If you spend a great deal of money maintaining your mother's home, and eventually it's worth $100 million and you give it away to charity, I don't think that makes you selfish. I, I'm glad that we all had this opportunity. If you have not gone in and seen the paintings inside close up, please make sure to go do that first. Thank you all very much for your attention. Once again, Bill, thank you. Thank you so much for all of your attention. Thank you to Jeremy and the Bella Scordo Foundation for partnering with us. Thanks so much.